We are really so pleased to be joined today by uh, em Emily Raymond. She's a professor and director of graduate studies in the history department at Virginia Commonwealth University. You know, at, at the Free Speech Center, one of the things we, we strive to do is to remind all Americans of the importance of the First Amendment and, and find ways to build truly constitutional literacy. And we've found by researching and presentation uh, that when you can marry those five freedoms of the First Amendment to the arts, people immediately grasp the importance and impact of, of what's happening. It's, uh, it's, it's much more dynamic than trying to study dusty documents uh, from the 1780s when you realize that some of the people you've seen in films and books and on, on broadcasts and on, on MP3s, downloads, all of those people, in addition to being artists, are also citizens. And, and uh, Professor Raymond's book is just exemplifies that spirit, people using their free speech to make a difference in American society. Um, her book, uh, Stars for Freedom, Hollywood, Black Celebrities, and the Civil Rights Movement is very powerful. And she discusses how Black entertainers uh, established in uh, uh, their own campaign in Hollywood in the 1950s. They were spokespeople, they were fundraisers, they participated in the strategy, they were cheerleaders for civil rights, and they made a significant difference, often at great risk to their own careers. Professor Raymond is also the author of From My Cold Dead Hands, Charlton Heston and American Politics. And she's currently working on projects about Paul Galante, a, uh, an American POW in Vietnam, and his wife Phyllis, and about the Women's Bank of Richmond. Welcome, Professor Raymond. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction and for hosting this event, and to Emily Flood in, for, in particular for setting it up and emailing back and forth. And I'm really proud that this is part of the, the Free Speech Center um, because it's very important to me personally, uh, but also to this story because there's all sorts of free speech issues that come up time and again. Like Ken said in Stars for Freedom, I argue that a very small group of Hollywood stars and especially black celebrities significantly assisted the civil rights movement by acting as spokespersons, fundraisers, strategists, and cheerleaders for movement organizations and particular activists. And they did this by using their public images, their show business and political connections, and their personal wealth for the movement's gain. And I particularly focus on the 1950s through the 1970s in this book. And I've sort of divided the, the the entertainers into different categories using show business verbiage. So I call kind of the main people I focus on the leading six. And these were the earliest, most consistent and the most heavily involved supporters of the movement throughout this entire period that I'm looking at. So the leading six were Harry Belafonte, Ossie Davis and Ruby Dee who were married Sammy Davis Jr., Sidney Poitier, and the comedian Dick Gregory. There were also what I call more of the supporting characters to the movement, and they were important to the movement, but they were less involved in the politics of it, um, less involved with the organizations, maybe not as consistent. So they were certainly um, impactful, but not in the consistent way that the leading six were. So this is a picture from the March on Washington and some of the people who would be considered supporting characters would be uh, Marlon Brando and Paul Newman, Diane Carroll right here, Burt Lancaster, Charlton Heston, and Lena Horne and a few others. And then there were some bit players. Um, people who were maybe sympathetic to the movement but didn't get involved in a particularly overt fashion, or they popped up a little bit later in the, in the movement's history. And these were TV personalities like Steve Allen or Ed Sullivan and the actresses Shelley Winters and Elizabeth Taylor. So it's a golden age of Hollywood who's who that you see kind of coming in and out of the book. Now, there's two really fascinating complications to the story in terms of 
the historical context. And one had to do with the House Un-American Committee, House Un-American Activities Committee, HUAC. And this was notorious for its anti-communism investigations. They had investigated Hollywood in the 1940s looking for subversive messages in films and what they considered um, anti-American activities in their personal lives in terms of the actors and the, the uh, producers and writers and so forth. And this investigation led to kind of a self-imposed blacklist that the Hollywood studios put together. And that really drove a lot of film performers out of controversial social activism. And the civil rights movement certainly was considered controversial. So this is our first big free speech issue is <laughs> right here. Uh, one of the most famous to be blacklisted was this man pictured here, Paul Robeson. And he was a very close friend with Poitier and Belafonte and Davis and Dee. He, they really considered him a mentor. And after he was blacklisted, he advised them, you know, don't be too radical, don't be a martyr, don't sort of go the way that I did, uh, because then you won't be able to really make any kind of impactful change. You'll be too isolated and too alienated. So while all of the leading six sort of heeded his advice, um, Belafonte even went so far as to denounce communism in the anti-communist publication counterattack. So some of them were able to kind of just slip through. Poitier in particular never signed a loyalty oath or made a statement, um, but Belafonte was sort of put in that position that he had to. And he remembers that as a very difficult period for him where he disappointed his friends on the left and they never quite forgave him for it. Um, another problem for celebrity activism during this period was the job situation for African Americans in Hollywood. The only jobs for Black Americans in the film industry were in acting, and the roles that were available tended to perpetuate commonly held stereotypes. They were usually in servile positions and often for the purpose of comic relief, which required exaggerated dialect, exaggerated mannerisms, just sort of general silliness. And on top of that, the white owned studios did not employ any black directors or writers, producers, or even any technical employees like makeup artists or set decorators or anything like that. So there's no one behind the scenes really telling them otherwise. So the two most successful black actors in Hollywood prior to the 1950s were pictured here, Hattie McDaniel, who was known in particular for playing Mammy and Gone with the Wind, and she won an Academy Award for that role. And Lincoln Perry, pictured here, his stage name was Stepin Fetchett. And they were both very gifted and Mammy, in, infused a lot of power into the, the Gone with the Wind role. And um, Lincoln Perry was really funny, but at the same time, their public images were not the kind of images that the leading civil rights organizations felt were right for spokespeople, for their groups. Um, the NAACP was the largest civil rights organization at that time. And here we have two different headlines. Um, in the 40s, the NAACP started a campaign to try to force the studios to provide better non-stereotypical improved roles for Black actors. So this first headline here, NAACP says it will fight stereotypes in motion pictures. So they go in and they have a lot of meetings um, and they feel like it's pretty successful, but the actors were very resentful. So this headline shows that the black stars, they're, they're resentful, they blast back at 
the NAACP's interference. And they say, we don't need you. We can choose our own roles. You know, what you're gonna do is just um, actually give us less roles. So there was a, a conflict during that period um, where you have, you don't have a partnership, in other words, between uh, the black actors and the civil rights organization, because they both feel like they're working against one another's best interests. So these are kind of the, the constraints. And I'm thinking to myself, well, how in the world could Hollywood celebrities and especially black actors take part in this incredibly controversial social movement when there's a, a blacklist and there's um, sort of conflict, um, like I just talked about. But there are two big changes after World War II that shifted the context a little bit. Um, one was the breakdown of the studio system. Six major studios had basically formed an oligopoly over the film industry. But in 1948, the Supreme Court case, United States versus Paramount Pictures, um, ordered the breakup of this kind of vertical integration that the studios had formed. And they particularly made them sell off their theaters and rethink their distribution chains. Um, and this change allowed for the rise of independent filmmakers who proved themselves willing to make films that were considered too controversial. Such films included message movies, with liberal racial themes that often promoted integration and in which African-Americans played leading roles as professional characters. So this movie, No Way Out from 1950, starring Sidney Poitier, that's a great example of that. And it basically defined Poitier's career where he played a professional, he was the lead, and he stood up to racism in a very resolute and inspiring way. These kinds of films um, also opened doors for Belafonte, Ossie Davis, Ruby Dee, and Sammy Davis Jr. But they were often small pictures with really tight budgets and limited theatrical runs. A lot of times Southern theaters refused to even show these films. So uh, while, Poitier was making a living as an actor. Um, it's within some constraints. Uh, another big change in Hollywood was the advent of television in the 1940s. And it was so popular increasingly throughout the 50s. So this provided new opportunities. The network programming uh, still continued to perpetuate racial stereotypes in a lot of ways, but the popularity of television variety shows I feel like opened up sort of a new way for African-American entertainers to connect with mainstream audiences because on variety shows, they just come on, they be themselves, they intermingle, they joke around, they pal around with the hosts. Um, and here we have Sammy Davis Jr. with Eddie Cantor and Steve Allen. And this is largely how mainstream Americans would, would learn and get to know and really seemed to embrace Sammy Davis Jr. So these developments allowed for black actors to develop public personas, which were more in line with the civil rights movement, and especially as it grew more urgent in the 1950s with Brown versus Board of Education, with the advent of Martin Luther King and his nonviolent civil disobedience um, activities and his thrust to national prominence. Um, however, I think it's important to point out that only Poitier was able to make a living as a film and television actor. Everybody else I'm talking about also supplemented their incomes, like through recording contracts or nightclub contracts or Broadway production because of the ongoing limitations in Hollywood. Um, and furthermore, big budget major releases still presented a lot of challenges to black actors in terms of their portrayal. And that's really illustrated in the making of the film Porgy and Bess. And this is the, the subject of the first chapter of my book. 
Um, it's, it's a period piece. It's set in the, the fictional slums of Catfish Row. And it was considered very controversial for its depiction of African-Americans as poor, as gambling, as drinking, um, as superstitious and so forth. The stars of the film, which were Poitier, Dandridge, Sammy Javis Jr. and Pearl Bailey had achieved enough celebrity status that they were able to convince the director and producer, Otto Priminger and Sam Goldwyn, uh, to revise the screenplay. And they, that's what they're doing in this picture. They're sitting down with the script and they're changing things that they think are too stereotypical and too problematic. So on one hand, this is a major big budget production. They were thrust into the celebrity scene with this movie and they're showing more power than probably any black actors in Hollywood ever had in their revising of the script. But at the same time, they, they didn't really feel that powerful. So that's where we sort of are when it comes to the civil rights movement. This, this leading six, they wanted to capitalize on the modest changes they'd seen in Hollywood, capitalize on what power they had um, in order to advance racial progress and apply those gains right back to Hollywood. And this speaks to really what they felt was their position as artists in American society, that they weren't just there to entertain and make money, but they also had another role. And for them, it was this, this movement. Um, so some of the, the things that they did, back to our leading six, some of the trailblazing activities that they pioneered. Uh, one thing that was very effective, starting as early as 1956, they attended, headlined, and sometimes even helped organize mass rallies and demonstrations for movement organizations and movement causes. There's a whole host of events, the Madison Square Garden Rally in 1956 in support of the Montgomery bus boycott, the 1957 prayer pilgrimage in Washington, DC, a youth march for integrated schools, that's what we have here, that was co-organized by Belafonte and the baseball player, Jackie Robinson, and a garment center civil rights rally in New York that Belafonte and Poitier headlined in 1960 for Martin Luther King. The star's participation in such events drew crowds, they attracted newspaper headlines, and the rallies themselves also served as an important source of news for Northern supporters about Southern activities, you know, we didn't have our, our internet and our phones and all that good stuff in those days to connect people. So these rallies could really be that kind of connection and brings, bring information to the Northern network and provides important support for the Southern network. Another thing the Leading Six did was headline numerous benefit shows. They performed for free and often produced all kinds of benefit shows in concerts for movement organizations. Um, Sammy Davis Jr. began doing such activities in 1958 with an Apollo theater benefit. And that one was really interesting because the NAACP asked him to do it and they wanted him and like a different performer every night for a week to come in and have this massive benefit. And Davis was the only person who would do it for free. Everyone else they asked required a fee. And so he ended up doing it five nights in a row for them. And that was the beginning of his, his relationship. And his benefits would become increasingly successful, especially as his fame grew with the Rat Pack and he, then he could bring the Rat Pack along and those could make a lot of money. Belafonte did tons of concerts as well. Um, so these had a lot of the same benefits as a, as a rally, but they much more explicitly raised money. And they also kind of added an air of glamor to the event because we can sort of see in this picture, this is an NAACP benefit and it's like a, a formal dinner, you know, so it was pretty fancy. 
Um, they also connected movement leaders and activists to politically and culturally powerful individuals. Both Sammy Davis Jr. and Belafonte campaign for John F. Kennedy and Belafonte especially helped connect Martin Luther King and Kennedy. And then after Kennedy won the election, Belafonte was a special advisor in his administration and helped facilitate voter registration projects in the Deep South, which was important to the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and Mississippi's Freedom Summer and so, so forth. Um, in the meantime, Black stars reached out to their white friends to encourage their participation in the movement, celebrity friends, I should say. Um, so, you know, like Sammy Davis Jr. bringing in Frank Sinatra is a really great example. And the movement organizations were able to develop these kind of go-to fundraising lists, a contact sheet, people they could call and say, listen, we're going to do this next weekend. Can you pop in? And they had a steady stream of, of artists who were willing to do that. And then finally, they did engage in a little bit of direct action. Very few celebrities were willing to march in Southern protests, and they especially wanted to stay away from civil disobedience, anything that might result in them going to jail. The primary exception is Dick Gregory over here. He went to jail at least eight times for movement activities in places like Greenwood, Arkansas, and I mean, sorry, Greenwood, Mississippi, and Chicago, and Birmingham. Um, another one, you might hear the fire truck behind me. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, another one is Theodore Bacall. He was a a folk singer, an actor, and he traveled throughout the Deep South and marched in Birmingham and went to jail there in 1963. And then also Charlton Heston, he joined a demonstration in Oklahoma City in 1961, which doesn't really seem that South to us maybe, but uh, he was really the first A-list star to join a, a demonstration. And it really provided a huge morale boost to the activists there who'd been marching for like over a year. So him being there was pretty exciting. So after all of these kind of pioneering activities, the movement would finally sort of catch on amongst Hollywood celebrities in the summer of 1963. And this was especially epitomized by 75 Hollywood stars who formed an arts group for the March on Washington in August, 1963. So there's a lot of pictures from this, this time period, or from this event. So I threw a bunch of them in here. There's Eartha Kitt with Marlon Brando and uh, Judy Garland and Charlton Heston. Um, Ossie Davis, his role at the March on Washington, he put together a group of artists who were willing to perform sort of all day long to try to keep the crowds entertained and happy. Um, a lot of people feared that violence would break out at the march or that the marchers would be attacked or something bad would happen. So he tried to bring what he called a country fair atmosphere to the march by having, you know, over, over the course of the day, all kinds of singing and speeches and comedy routines and so on. So, that was really important. There's Sammy Davis Jr. out amongst the crowd. Uh, Poitier with Burt Lancaster. Lancaster brought in a, had, in a dramatic flourish, he had this big scroll that had a bunch of names of actors who were in Europe and they couldn't come to the march, but they wanted to lend their support. So that's what he did up on stage during the march. Um, here is Lena Horne in the white and then Josephine Baker. Her appearance at the march was very exciting because she had, she had never been blacklisted, but she'd still been blacklisted in, a, in an odd way. She uh, was a performer from the United States, but when she traveled overseas in some of her, in some of her performances, she criticized the United States on its racial record. So the State Department revoked her passport and wouldn't let her back in the United States for several years. Um, so when she comes back in 1963 and participated in the march, 
it's like, okay, now the blacklist is over, Josephine Baker's back. It's like a new era sort of thing. And it was very exciting to see her there. Um, and there's Paul Newman and his wife, Joanne Woodward with um, A. Philip Randolph, who thought of the March on Washington originally back in the forties during World War II. So I've always liked that picture. Um, so this really marked a, a turning point when it came to celebrity involvement in the movement, this, uh, this march. And after that, we will see much more open or organizational support from, from Hollywood. They're willing to lend their names to even the more controversial elements of the civil rights movement. This is Ruby D, for example with members of the Black Panther Party who had been arrested. She's defending the so-called Panther 22 in this picture. Um, they were willing to also take on more controversial issues. Um, for example, Marlon Brando in this picture, he is marching in Torrance, California in 1963 for integrated housing. And this paved the way for an arts division during California's Proposition 14 fight over open housing legislation. And this was an extremely bitter campaign. It's just hard to imagine that even two or three years earlier that any stars would have been willing to jump in on this and 150 do in 1964. Um, they're more willing to go south despite their fears. In fact, Sammy Davis Jr. had often joked with Martin Luther King that he'd go anywhere King wanted him to go, except South, because he thought it was too dangerous. Um, but during the Selma to Montgomery walk in 1965, a whole host of celebrities come in, and especially for the last couple of days, um, where they gather at the city of St. Jude and come into the to the state capitol. And there's all kinds of celebrities there. And um, Belafonte even led an impromptu concert um, on the Alabama Capitol steps. So, and here's Burt Lancaster. He came down in 1966 for the Meredith March in Mississippi. And then another change after the March on Washington was that celebrities also sort of went global they no longer really feared the, that anti-communist backlash. So they started putting on benefit shows outside of the United States. Belafonte in particular um, did a show in, in Sweden and some other places in Europe. And they also began criticizing American involvement in Vietnam War, even before Martin Luther King did. So we really see a new um, sort, of, sort of attitude about what they, what they can say and be willing to say. So as I kind of come to the conclusion here, one thing that I wanted to really try to do was to attempt to measure the impact. It was very easy, well, for a researcher, it was pretty easy to, to document everything the leading six did and you know, find evidence of this benefit show and that benefit show and whatever. Um, but it was much harder to figure out, well, what exactly did that mean? I mean how, did that help the movement or was it just something they did? Um, so one thing that I tried to look for um, was with the money that they raised and think about, okay, well, how much money did they raise and how much, how much of an impact could that make on one organization? So I would look at sort of percentage wise, um, what it was, the money from a benefit show compared to the organization's overall budget. So for example, the Rat Pack gave a concert for King that raised $22,000 this was 25% of the operating budget for King's organization for that year. So one benefit raised a quarter of the money that they needed that year. So that's really an enormous impact. Um, sometimes I could also trace the money, like 
where it went in terms of specific programs, what exactly it would buy, like walkie talkies for voter registration in the South, for example. Um, another thing I was looking for was publicity and I could compare headlines before and after celebrity participation. And one example is the Pine Bluff movement in Arkansas. They had not received any publicity at all for months until Dick Gregory went there and went to jail. And after that, the New York Times is covering the Pine Bluff movement. So those kinds of examples also were helpful. Um, also kind of looking at polls or kind of the tone of um, the headlines. After Salma, for example, the New York Times really praised the celebrities who were there for credit for adding to the, the trappings of the triumph and keeping things upbeat throughout the entire day, especially since the march had sort of started against pretty big odds. Um, another thing was emotional impact, which of course is very hard to quantify, but I could look at letters from the time period. Um, and one great example, Dick Gregory, personally delivered 14,000 pounds of food to Greenwood, Mississippi at a time when uh, employees or sharecroppers were getting fired or getting kicked off their land for helping civil rights activists. And there was real concern that they were gonna have like, a widespread famine in certain parts of Mississippi. And so Gregory raised all this money and brought in all this food and a civil rights activist named James Foreman wrote him a letter saying that thousands of hungry Negroes in Lafleur, Sunflower, and Coahoma counties know perhaps for the first time in their lives that they are not friendless and that they do not have to be afraid to try to get their rights. The number of field workers has increased from 30 to 42, again, thanks to you. I hate to sound maudlin, but your efforts have really increased our determination to stay in Mississippi and get the job done. So that was such a powerful letter. Um, activist interviews also, I was able to interview quite a few people who worked with the celebrities. And they said that it was such a morale boost to know that these celebrities not only supported them, but also sort of looked up to them, that they were stars and the stars eyes. So, you know, here's John Lewis getting bailed out of jail by Sidney Poitier. That'd be pretty exciting. <laughs> so those kinds of interactions really meant a lot uh, to the activists who oftentimes, you know, they're either being ignored completely or they're being terrorized, you know. So having someone treating them this way was very important. And then finally, in terms of impact is on Hollywood itself. Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act allowed movement gains to be applied to Hollywood and especially in winning more jobs behind the scenes with like the makeup artists and the set decorators and so forth to kind of break uh, union control over those jobs. And the Stars for Freedom also became screenwriters, producers and directors from which they could insist and shape and develop improved roles and more employment for opp opportunities for African-Americans in the film industry. So I kind of end the book with Buck and the Preacher from 1972. And this starred Belafonte and D and Poitier directed the movie and it's a, a black Western basically and it just kind of from Porgy and Bess, you know, to this movie, it really spoke to kind of their changing position in Hollywood. So I think that the Stars for Freedom really helped pave the way for more celebrity involvement in politics. They established a blueprint um, and the media age, the media landscape has changed in many ways, but I think a lot of the, the strategies and techniques are actually the same. So thank you so much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you, Professor Raymond. I, uh, I was struck watching your, your uh, black and white photos from the, from the parties.
And, um, you know, I can imagine with our students who are typically 18 to 22, um, seeing those pictures and going, who are these guys? <laughs> and, you know, and all I can convey is that they were the biggest names in Hollywood, many of them. You may know Marlon Brando from, uh, from The Godfather. You may know a young Judy Garland from The Wizard of Oz. But these were major, major players. And, uh, and so think Drake and Lady Gaga and you're kind of in the ballpark, but they, are, they were phenomenal. Uh, I'm gonna ask Emily Flood to, to get our questions uh, started, but I do have a quick question uh, for you, uh, Professor Raymond. A good number of the students who are listening to you now are intend to be filmmakers mm -hmm. and, uh, and documentarians and enter the field. Were there allies of these Hollywood figures behind the camera? Were there movie makers who are particularly receptive to the message? Yes, um, and especially the, the people involved with those message movies. So um, Stanley Kramer is a good example of one. Um, let's see, I'm kind of blanking right now. Um, Otto Priminger kind of was, um, Daryl Zanuck. So yeah, there are different producers and screenwriters who um, definitely were sympathetic. And to what degree they allowed the stars to um, do any screenwriting themselves, I think is, um, was not that high. But at the same time, they, they were trying to say something about um, about race in the United States that was much different than what was normally on screen. So there certainly were, and it was usually in those message movies. Well, thank you. Emily Flood, your turn. Emily, why do you think, I mean, we see it all the time today, but celebs seem to have such a powerful voice when it comes to social justice issues in general. Do you think it's just increasing? Do you think they still, the minority groups have just as big of a voice as the non-minority groups? I mean, how do you see that today playing out? I know it's a lot different today because, you know, when this story kind of started, hardly anybody was speaking out. So if someone did, then it was big news. <laughs> and now everyone is speaking out in some way for a lot of the same reasons that the celebrities are admired for one reason or another. Um, they have a connection with Usually if they're a huge celebrity, that that means they have a connection with a really broad audience, you know, not just a niche audience, but people from all walks of life and ages and so forth. And so getting a political message out from that regard is really important. I think that's one thing that Martin Luther King really recognized about the leading six was that they were popular amongst black audiences and white audiences. They were considered crossover stars. And so they would, King felt like there's no way his movement could succeed if he didn't have white allies and couldn't convince white Americans of what he was trying to say. And so the leading six were really useful in that way because they already had a white audience. They already had white admirers and so then they could help they could sort of play off each other in spreading that message um let's see so there's something about yeah the reach and the audience and the connect I, stars still have you know really powerful connections just like we saw with belafonte and kennedy and if you think about kim kardashian you know meeting with donald trump about uh about prison reform and what that ended up doing. And it was something that people had been talking to Trump about. I mean, I think he was open to the message before, but then when Kim Kardashian came in and made it an event with her, with her bright yellow heels, you know, like she just had this like glamorous way of going into the White House, um, then that turned it into something really big. So I think, yeah, like I was saying, I think a lot of the, the same um, techniques are there, even if the media is slightly different. Essentially, my question is, is it feels like 
in more of recent years that there's been more criticisms directed towards celebrities using their voice. And I even remember I had a book by Hilary Belafonte where even he criticized, I think, Jay-Z and Beyonce for saying they weren't doing as much work. And it seems like today, like while there is certain things that do get noticed, it doesn't seem like celebrities as much like they're talked about or do you hear their stances like Kanye West was running for president and there's other people telling about who you should vote for but it sort of doesn't feel on the same level like you see some of them protest or stuff but uh it doesn't really seem in the same way of like I mean Kim Kardashian but affecting in the same sort of civil rights change so is there have you seen like over the years a more effort to sort of like I don't want to say silent celebrities they're huge but kind of like make them like if you go into a lot of like depending on news sources or uh just the environment some people kind of they disdain at the like celebrities talking about politics or getting involved would you say this like has had this reaction later on Yes, and yes, in different ways. So yeah, I think the media is more fragmented. Um, so it's easier for people to um, criticize and it be seen immediately. And so almost everyone gets some kind of pushback or some kind of backlash because if they, that's how social media is, you know, you can tweet almost anything and someone will criticize you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think everyone, um, is subject to that. Um, there was always uh, pushing and backlash to Black celebrities who did not get involved. Um, there's a, I can't remember what you, I think it's, I think it's Birmingham in 1963. A bunch of people were trying to pressure Nat King Cole to come to Birmingham and perform. And a few other black singers and they did not want to come and they said they would not. And there was kind of a pressure campaign against them in the black press um, to kind of shame them into coming and saying, you're not putting your life on the line. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. And it, it's very much what you're, I mean, it's very reminiscent of what you're talking about there with Belafonte and Jay-Z, the little uh, kind of spat that they had and they got past it, I guess, but um, so there was that happening, um, a lot and some black performers continued to perform in the South to segregated audiences. And there was pressure that they shouldn't do that, you know, that they should refuse. Um, and some artists just would not refuse. They would like, I'll just perform however I need to, you know, if that's the way I need to connect with my audience, that's fine. Um, so I think there was always a lot of debate um, throughout this, this, these years that I'm talking about. Um, so I forget the lady's name who you mentioned, but the lady who got blacklisted, who was in the military and like, they took away her passport. Mm -hmm. Um, do you know how Europe responded to what she was saying about Americans? Like, did they take any action at all about that? That's a great question. And I don't know it that well. I, she was very, very popular overseas. Um, so she could continue, especially in France, she could continue to make a career for herself. Mm -hmm. um, so unlike Robeson, Paul Robeson, his passport was also taken away. And he, no one would book him for concerts or anything. And so like there, he just could not make a living as an artist anymore. Like that just was over. Uh, whereas with Baker, she could because she performed throughout Europe. So it was a little bit different. But she, and to clarify, she was in that kind of military suit and she wasn't really in mm -hmm. the military. But <laughs> okay, yeah, I was wondering about that um, too yeah. when you said she was an artist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she was, known, she was known for these really elaborate costumes and mm -hmm. so that, that get up is very different from her normal performing outfit. <laughs> I'll read a question someone typed out. They were asking, how come... Back then, whenever the African-American society grew bigger and more powerful in, in that society, people still did not seem to give them the justice it stated in the amendments. And I'm assuming they mean in film and TV as well. Yeah, I know. It's a hard, I'm not sure what period exactly we're talking about there. Um, if we're talking about more like 70s and 80s or more in the present day. Um, 
but Hollywood it was, it was a really hard industry to change. And even when it became more, much more liberal in the 1970s during the, the new Hollywood phase, um, it still was really dominated by white men and even more than it was in the 30s in terms of there was a there are more women screenwriters in the 30s than there were in the 70s. So it's becoming more liberal, but it also is becoming more violent and darker. And um, it, in terms of like the kind of the male artistry, that didn't change at all. Um, one thing I talk about in my book that I think is really interesting is the, uh, the development of the black exploitation genre, which were black films. Uh, <laughs> there's all sorts of great ones, iconic ones like Shaft and Foxy Brown and Coffee. And, um, and I feel like that was a big turning point, the success of those films, because they were often like the message movies, they were often low budget and they had to do a lot of their own stunts and they were filmed quickly. And some of them had black directors and screenwriters, but not all of them, but they all had black protagonists who were action heroes. And they, they crossed, all, unlike the message movies, which were all very serious dramas, the black exploitations were more fun. So you had, um, more action, more comedy, plus horror and genre, or horror and drama. So just a wide variety of, of movies. And there are like 200 such films made in the 70s. So this seemed to really be a turning point. Um, and they were criticized. Some people felt like they were kind of stereotypical and they showed too much nudity and too much violence and too much drug use and things like that. But a lot of movies did that in the 70s. And, and <laughs> even family films managed to sneak in some nudity in the 1970s. <laughs> so they, um, they really proved that um, people other than Sidney Poitier could carry a movie. And so you get in Wesley Snipes and Eddie Murphy and Holly Berry and all kinds of black stars after that. So. I feel like that they, a lot of progress was made, but there's still a lot of pushback too. And we see that every year with the Academy Awards. Um, so it's still an ongoing dialogue for sure. Do you think that when uh, people like myself, people that are white, um, take a similar stance on things that they seem disingenuous or that they are not as accepted by the black community, um, and whether that be, you know, a long time ago or more current day, uh, whichever way you prefer to answer it, I'm just wondering if, if there's a, a less of a connection if, or if they perceive it just as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that was a, an issue where the best example I can think of from my, the book is um, Marlon Brando, where people felt like he genuinely cared and that he was um, sympathetic and genuine, but they also didn't always feel like his help was constructive or useful because um, sometimes they just felt like he made things worse. And a good example was at the Academy Awards and I think it was 1972, he didn't accept his his Academy Award for Best Actor, he sent an actress in his place who introduced herself as Sasheen Littlefeather. And she said that he wasn't accepting the award because Hollywood had had a history of stereotypical portrayals of Native Americans. And he was fighting for Native American causes during the same period. Um, but it, it became kind of scandalous. I mean, some people just thought it was inappropriate to bring politics to the whole thing. Uh, people called him a hypocrite because he was in The Godfather about Italian-American mafiosos, you know, which has its own stereotypes. Um, and then it turned out that Sasheen Littlefeather, uh, she, it wasn't a lie necessarily, but she wasn't exactly who she portrayed herself to be. So her own relationship with Native American activism was kind of tenuous. So 
it just created so much controversy and it didn't really seem to be helpful to the American Indian movement at the time. So there are dangers like that, I think all the time that everyone is prone to make, but it, I think it does become worse if it's a white person trying to speak on behalf or in favor of minorities because it seems like they, um, they don't know what they're talking about and they're kind of imposing their views and then making things worse, you know? So <laughs> there are times when celebrities face backlash because they say something out of ignorance, you know, they, and it's so easy to do on Twitter in particular. I mean, cause people, it's spontaneous. That's a great thing about Twitter. Um, but a lot of times people take things out of context or retweet things and then they find themselves having to apologize. Was there a moment where you, that you might've found in your research when black actors made a conscious effort to shift away from pushing against the NAACP because they wanted to keep their jobs even though their jobs were holding on to negative stereotypes on screen? And um, was there a shift when, they, when black actors said, you know what, we could get farther in our movement if we start portraying, you know, more fair and accurate representations of our community on screen. Um, and I think, you know, I, I was reminded of the black exploitation movement as I was thinking about that and how empowering that time must have been when black filmmakers are creating their own stories on screen and, you know, even imagining like actions, action films and that sort of thing. Um, so I think you answered that, but if you have any other thoughts on that, um, and I have a follow-up to that. Your question about the NAACP, it's interesting because they, the NAACP actually kind of backed off to, backed off. Um, they had tried to have a boycott of the television show Amos and Andy um, because of its minstrel roots. You know, it was created by uh, white radio stars and they, I, we, you wouldn't exactly call it black face, but it was like black dialect that they were using. Um, and it was a really popular radio show and it had, it was popular with white and black audiences. So they decided to bring that to TV and they were going to hire an all black cast. And some people were really praising this move because it was going to have, it's going to be an all black TV show in the middle of the 1950s, which was huge. But on the other hand, there is a pushback about, they were worried about the stereotypes that would be in the, the show because it was a working class uh, duo, Amos and Andy, and it was a comedy and they were worried that there would be just too many, you know, butts of jokes, etc. So the NAACP tried to boycott the show and then the leadership did, but the NAACP membership would not support the boycott because they liked the show and they liked that there were African-Americans on television. And so it's a real disconnect between the leadership and the membership. Um, but nevertheless, the controversy about this attempted boycott ended up leading to the cancellation of the show. And so it just was like, um, kind of disappointing all around, you know? <laughs> like, so people were angry about that or disappointed or just did, wasn't quite the result that they wanted. Um, so I, I feel like the NAACP sort of backed off a little bit about boycotting this and boycotting that and pressuring this and pressuring that. Um, but in the meantime, I think there was a conscious effort. Um, Poitier and Belafonte and Davis and Dee in particular, they had come out of New York and a particular theater group that was all about um, getting rid of stereotypical images and having more powerful um, and professional roles. And so they were committed to that even before they came to Hollywood. So they kind of overlapped, I guess. Um, I would just quickly follow up on something that really struck me in, in your presentation was the idea of the Paramount decrees, um, you know, breaking up the studio system. Mm -hmm. And recently we've seen a federal judge in New York throw out the Paramount decrees. I've been talking about this in my web series class, like how, what is going to, 
happen to independent film because of it. And, and now I guess we're in this environment where, you know, um, if the movie theaters don't come back and uh, we're, we're left with Disney Plus, <laughs> that mean for independent film and, and, you know, maybe black filmmakers or other minority filmmakers that are wanting to make films that maybe push push, um, you know, their own storytelling that maybe might not be palatable to white America. You know, I don't know, it's a really difficult time in our country. And I'm just curious where where the throwing out of Paramount decrees might lead in terms of- I know, of I didn't even know that. I'm glad you told me. Oh uh, yeah, that was uh, last month, I believe, or August. Okay, I have to check that out. Yeah, I know, because I, in some ways it seems like right now we're in the middle of like the golden age of creativity. I mean, there's so many platforms and so many channels and um, so many ways people can get their stories out, but I don't know what this will mean either. So yeah, I have a friend who's an LGBT filmmaker and um, hearing her speak, she had um, made one feature film that was called Women Who Kill about a, a lesbian whose ex-girlfriends, she's, she's concerned that her ex-girlfriend's a serial killer. And it was really clever, but when she went to, she made the film by self-funding, but when she went to pitch a second feature, she was told by several executives that they already had an LGBT film for the year, so they didn't need any more. And so I, I feel like when consolidation in media happens, um, you start to see lesser opportunities for underrepresented filmmakers and that Paramount decrees getting eliminated is definitely a concern. Yeah, and especially the studios, even though they had to sell off the theater chains, they still have incredible control over distribution. So if that is altered, it could, it could be bad. I guess we'll, we'll see. Ellie, I, I, I love that you got the last word in. Thank you for that rich conversation. Thank you. Professor Raymond, we're indebted uh, to you for being a part of this and sharing the contents of your book. Your book is available, as, as everyone here needs to know, it's available on Amazon, Kindle, a variety of other ways. So please check that out. Um, it's been a real honor to have you here, Professor Raymond. Thank you so much.